Good evening. This is Reflections on the Challenge of Faith with Adrian Roberts on Sunday the 12th of February 2017. Murder, adultery, divorce and swearing. These are the topics I'm going to talk about this evening because they're the topics covered by Jesus in Matthew's Gospel chapter 5 verses 21 to 37. First of all, murder. This is the one thing that I can probably safely say I've never committed of the many things condemned by Jesus. But if I were to ask myself why I haven't committed murder, I couldn't claim to any great virtue. It's probably largely a matter of lack of opportunity, upbringing, living in a sort of social media where problems are rarely, if ever, solved by recourse to that sort of thing. And so I can't claim any great credit for it. But I have to say that in my heart of hearts I have nurtured the kind of resentment towards other people from which murder can come. I have treated other people as objects, seen them as means to my satisfaction or obstacles to my plans for life. And it is this sort of thing from which murder comes as well. And when Jesus says, your fathers were told, you shall not murder, but I say to you, if you call your brother a fool, then you will be answerable before the fires of hell, then I think this is what he's getting at. He's saying that it isn't good enough just to avoid the act. You have to try to avoid the kind of disposition, the kind of attitude from which the act comes. And surely there is great wisdom in this. When we come to Jesus' teaching on adultery, which follows, exactly the same pattern emerges. On the one hand, we have the commandment, you shall not commit adultery. And then Jesus says, but I say to you, if you look at a woman lustfully, you have already committed adultery with her in your heart. Now this does require a little bit of explaining. First of all, it is a saying delivered by a male to probably a largely male audience, and so it is from a male perspective. But that shouldn't restrict it, and it shouldn't put us off, just because it is from that perspective in its original form. Secondly, looking at a woman lustfully translates a Greek verb, epithumeo, which doesn't mean sexual desire, but means setting your heart on someone. It means intending to bring about a certain end. And I no doubt that this corresponds to whatever Aramaic original Jesus actually spoke. So it's not that Jesus is condemning sexual desire, though unfortunately many people in the past have taken him to have been doing so. Instead, what I think he's doing is, as with the murder example, he's saying, where does adultery come from? Is it actually any better to have urges after somebody to, who is married to somebody else, or to have urges after somebody when you yourself are married, and to fail in the attempt because you're too shy, or perhaps because you do actually make the attempt and are rejected. Morally, you're no better than the person who is successful, because what you're doing is behaving towards somebody else, again, in an objectified way. You are seeing them, irrespective of whatever network of relationships they may be in, irrespective of whatever network of relationships you, be, you may be in, you are simply seeing them as somebody who can solve a problem for you, to satisfy some desire, to be somebody for you, irrespective of what other plans and commitments they may have. And so there is wisdom here too. When we come to Jesus' teaching on divorce, this is a little more difficult, but I do think there is a similarity here as well. Jesus goes against the prevailing teaching of his time, found in the Old Testament, which was that divorce was acceptable as long as the husband gave his wife a writ of dismissal. Women were not permitted by Jewish law to divorce their husbands at all, which seems rather unjust to a modern perspective, and perhaps was to Jesus as well. But Jesus says that uh, divorce is impermissible, that there is something indissoluble about the marriage bond, but he does allow an exception in the case of marital unfaithfulness. Translating a rather obscure Greek word, again we have no idea what the Aramaic original may have been. But here again, I think Jesus is looking to the heart of the matter. I don't think he's saying something legalistic about divorce. And I suspect that Christians have always at some level realised this. Because in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, 
Jesus' teaching on divorce is slightly different, where he allows of no exception at all, and talks moreover of women divorcing their husbands, which looks like a reference to a Greco-Roman media in which such divorce was possible. But what I think he's getting at is that there is something essential about the marriage bond. It is not just a casual contract that may be put aside if something better comes along or some problem arises. When a divorce happens, something has been broken. And I suspect that there has been sin somewhere along the line. Maybe both parties are party, partly to blame. Maybe the original sin, as it were, was when the parties got together in the first place, contracted a marriage where their hearts weren't in it, where there was immaturity or folly or thoughtlessness of some kind. And the divorce may in fact be the best end to a bad situation. The fact that Jesus talks of marital unfaithfulness as the only criterion for divorce is also puzzling to a modern listener. There are surely plenty of other cases. Think of abusive relationships, think of domestic violence, where divorce must seem like the best solution again to a very bad situation indeed. But I don't think guided by the Spirit of God, Christians should exclude these other criteria for divorce. And actually, if you look over history, Christian responses to the problem of marital breakdown have been many and various. It has simply not been the case that up until recently, marriage was totally indissoluble in all circumstances. Whether the word used was divorce or the slightly different phenomenon of annulment may not ultimately be that important. But here again, the heart of marriage should be seen as an indissoluble sacramental bond between two people. And when it breaks down, it is a tragedy whose effects last for many years. But here again, there can be forgiveness and reconciliation. And I think this is something also that lies at the heart of Jesus' teaching. Though we are sinners, though relationships break down, that does not need to be the end of the story. When we come finally to swearing, here again, there has been so much misunderstanding. When Jesus says, do not swear by heaven or earth, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, I don't think he is remotely referring to casual swearing in the sense of obscene language, the sort of thing we regard as swearing today. I'm not defending the practice of swearing, though I think there are many situations where perhaps it's excusable. And we have different views about this. Personally, I have a preference for the good old Anglo-Saxon four-letter words over against the more troubling tendency of many people to cheapen the name of Jesus himself by using it as a swear word. But actually what Jesus is talking about is something very different. And again, it fits in with the overall theme of moving on from strict regulation to what lies at the heart of it. I think Jesus is talking about people who seek to bind their assurances by swearing by some holy thing. And I think he's saying that when you swear by something, you are doing so in a fundamentally dishonest media. It is no accident, and a very good thing too, that in courts of law, that arena in which people have most reason to lie, either to protect their liberty or to protect their money or both, that in courts of law, swearing oaths on Bibles is required or on some other holy book or object of sacred significance. But Jesus is saying, I think, that ultimately it would be a lot better if we were fundamentally trustworthy people, if we pursued honesty and integrity, then we wouldn't need to swear by anything at all. Our yes would be yes, and our no would be no. And I think it is a very valuable thing and part of a training in the Christian virtues, as all these teachings are, to pursue truthfulness and integrity in all our dealings. But I think the most extraordinary thing of all, apart from all the human wisdom in these sayings, is something that is often not noticed, familiar as this part of the Sermon on the Mount has become, to a modern audience who may not have quite picked up on the shocking resonance of how it must have appeared to Jesus' original hearers. The law of Moses, the Torah, encapsulated in the heart, at his heart, in the Ten Commandments, was seen as uttered, as laid down on the direct authority of God via Moses. 
it was written in elder times to Moses by God, effectively. And with an extraordinary casualness, Jesus reformulates it with his own authority, but I say to you, your fathers were told, but I say to you, this refrain is repeated throughout the teachings. And in this, almost casually, by implication, Jesus is laying claim to divine authority. He is putting his own teachings on the same level of those of God himself in the Ten Commandments. And although this is an old argument, I think it still has force today. Normally somebody who claims divine authority for themselves is rightly seen as insane, as somebody who's a megalomaniac, as somebody who has pathological tendencies, and you would not expect such a person to speak with a voice of such pellucid wisdom as is found in these teachings on the virtues of character which must transcend the regulations. And yet here they are by a person who is claiming divine authority, effectively claiming the authority of God himself. And this contradiction between somebody who claims divine authority, surely the act of the insane, but who speaks such utter wisdom, is a contradiction which I think challenges all of us, Christian and non-Christian alike, as we reflect on these wise sayings of Jesus and try to let them have an effect in our hearts and in our lives. Good evening.